Science is not, a comp- is, is not compatible with spirituality. That's what I've heard for a long time. It's not the case. Through science, we understand the micro and macro lens of what life is. And as our dear Carl Sagan said, it is the connection to spirituality. Ultimately, I'm going to show you a different perspective. From a neurobiological perspective, how is it that we move from signal to wisdom? But first, why don't we show you how small we are in this magnificent universe that we form part of. These quarks are the smallest things we know right now. I have this guess, this intuition, that we are infinite outwards and infinite inwards. And hopefully through these visuals, just for a few minutes, you will see everything that's within us. Please enjoy.
That is everything we know that exists. I think, you know, when, when I met uh, author Frank White, who's a good friend, he created this concept or identified this concept that we call the overview effect. And when he interviewed now over 300 different astronauts, they all had a similar experience when they saw a different perspective of Earth. I wondered, what if we saw a perspective of the universe and the universe within? And what are these similarities? One of these images is of brain cells. The other is of clusters in our universe. Which one is which? This is a cosmic uh, forest, and those are neural cells. Again, it seems like we have a universe inside of us. And while you heard a lot about my accolades, that is not what makes me who I am. I'm very fortunate to have three careers, the third one being neurobiology, neuroscience. I'm a Harvard-trained neuroscientist, working at the cutting edge of innovation with sensory enrichment or sensory design, using these environmental elements like light, sound, temperature, motion, et cetera, to influence our brain, to enable human behavioral change, to empower people. Now, those accolades don't make me who I am. It's those struggles that make me who I am. And what's interesting was as I was becoming a neuroscientist, I was going through some very tough life experiences. In a matter of three years, I went through a major divorce, which cost me half of everything that I worked so hard for. I lost a business. I was diagnosed with cancer, went through radiation and chemo. I lost a grandparent. My other grandparent committed suicide after that. What makes us continue? What makes us step out of that darkness? As I was learning about the senses, as I was learning about the brain, I was putting to practice what I was learning. And today I want to show you how you can discover the human senses and how it can influence your behavior. I want to also share how you can learn more about the neuroscience, not just of our emotions, but of who we are. And does that define us? Also, we want to identify tools for how do we get better? How do we make change happen? And I believe I have a way for us to explore. So what I'm going to be talking about is this journey that starts in our external environment with these sensory signals, which later get translated in our bodies into data, which later are interpreted by our brain as information. This information, as we use it, becomes individual knowledge. But what happens when we go beyond individual knowledge into collective knowledge? That's what I like to call wisdom. So I'm going to take you on a journey. And then we're going to look at some of the examples in the work that we're doing at My Cocoon to share how we're empowering others through sensation, through perception, through attention. This world around us is filled with something we call the electromagnetic spectrum. These are frequencies and wavelengths, and we talk about it a lot in these environments, but most of us don't really grasp what they are. When I look at the senses, I actually see the same thing just at different speeds. Light being the fastest, sound being the second, touch being the third, temperature being the fourth, and finally scent being the last one, the slowest one. So it's all about speed and how our brain interprets these elements. Ultimately, life is a journey, as we said, outward as it is inward. And these are complex mechanisms. So it's difficult when we talk about wellness and when we talk about certain societal challenges, because we all see the world we perceive, and we perceive things differently. The senses are the same way. They're personal, they're perceptual. So I want to do a little practice. If everyone can close your eyes, and just let me guide your voice, and you're going to do the rest with your mind. I want you to go, I don't know, let's think like somewhere between 10 and 12 years old, or as young as you can think. I want you to think of a meal that either your parent or caregiver prepared for you. 
go to that place in your mind. What does it taste like? What does it smell like? Who was that person cooking? The more you engage with these memories, the more you can see how real life can be. Now, we've used techniques like this to help people remember their name when they have Alzheimer's or to help children living with autism to just calm down. The power of our, and I see so many people smiling, it's so beautiful to see you smiling. We can connect forward and backwards through our senses. And I want to show you how this works. Because just with those words, you were able to connect these different emotions. And several of you that have a really big grin, I can see you almost tasting that. It all begins with a signal, just one signal. And about every 60 seconds, our body, our sensory receptors process 11 million signals. That's a lot of information. So part of what I'm going to do is not just share you how this information gets transferred, but I'm also going to share a little bit more on how we can use some of that information to bring up other information like muscle memory. So we know the senses through the organs. This is something that Aristotle helped us kind of understand. But the senses are way beyond the five organs we normally describe. The senses aren't necessarily what you see here. That's what we know them to be. And yes, all these signals get translated, or what we call transduction in the brain. But ultimately, this is what's going on. You've probably never seen this image. These are our senses. These are our sensory receptors. This is what we have as humans, as a unique code, a unique language that only our species really understands in the same way. So even though we are all different, even though sensory is perceptual, even though it's personal, these are the biological components that allow us to interact with the universe that we experience. Not all animals have this same combination. And these receptors start with the eye, but also in all 6.4 trillion cells are uh, photosensitive. So we have light receptors. We have motion, chemical, temperature, and we also have pain receptors, which are not here. Now, this is the way I look at the senses. And why am I talking about the senses? Why am I connecting this with the universe, with the innerverse? I feel that these could be the potential of the future of medicine, what I call perception medicine. Currently, we are seeing the age of abyss of diseases of despair. And that is my goal. How can I make a dent and reduce the diseases of despair today? What do I mean by diseases of despair? I'm talking about the anxiety, anxiety epidemic that we're facing today. One in four people are suffering from chronic mental health issues. So I want you to think something. Think of four friends, or three friends, and they're all okay. That means you're not. Okay? They're all okay, but you're not. Someone who we interact with in our daily life, and most probably us included, struggle with things like shame, with things like acceptance, with things like purpose and meaning. These are elements that we really don't quite understand from a neurological end, but we do understand how to influence them. So when we sense something, it's what we call a bottom-up approach. These sensory receptors are all around our body, and they pick these signals up and send them to the brain. The brain then interprets these signals and almost translates these signals into neurochemical language that our brain speaks, and then does a top-down approach to tell our body how to experience or perceive the environment. Ultimately, sensation and perception formulate attention. So when I talk about perception, as we said, it's organizing sensory information the way it comes in. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's translating sensory information the way it comes in. What's interesting about the brain is that you can access different ideas, different moments in time, 
through one sensory input. It'll actually bring up the other sensory information. What's tricky about the senses is that they're not always accurate because we have a predictive brain, and I'll be talking a little bit about that. Now, how do these neurochemical signals get translated into what we call emotions? These are just some, but there are neurotransmitters that have this and contain this information which direct us how to feel. And I'm sure you've heard of dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, and adrenaline. These are the main ones. Ultimately, this is the language of our emotions. And our senses are the canvas. It's what, it, what brings life to how we feel. Now, this is the work of Paul Eckerman, uh, who was funded by the Dalai Lama a few years back at Stanford to do an incredible work on looking at emotions. And what I love about this visual is that it allows you to see the main emotions that we pretty much understand and study. But if you look at them, I wish I, I'm going to create this one day in a 3D, because they're like gases. That's the way I see emotions. They're gases. It's not like a solid thing. They, they blend with one another. They influence one another. And what I found interesting in my practice is that when you have extreme emotions, like fear and sadness, or disgust, or anger, you can translate those to compassion, to empathy, and to some of the positive emotions that we're trying to promote and instill here, to harness and harvest. So emotions have a particularly strong influence on our attention, as I mentioned, and especially modulating how we feel, as well as motivating what we do and really challenging our behavior. Obviously, when you're going to make a decision, Think about your brain, right? Think about all those thoughts that come in. Should I do this? Should I not do that? Your brain is basically designed to keep you safe. Now, in all its magnificence, I want to dispel two big myths that I hear all the time. So people come up to me all the time to ask me random questions about the brain. Number one question I get asked about the brain, is it true that we only use 10% of our brain? Well. We use all of our brain. <laughs> I don't think we would be functioning if we would only use 10% of our brain. Now, our awareness, or what we call consciousness, that's pretty much what we call that 10%. Now, I've been speaking for about 15 minutes. And in those 15 minutes, every single person in this room was breathing. But just now, your attention made you realize your breathing pattern. Your brain was helping you breathe the whole time doesn't mean your awareness needs to be there. What's interesting is that as we bring our awareness to what's important to us, we're guiding our brain and really cementing the foundation for how we think and how we behave. The second myth I want to dispel is that a lot of people talk about the brain in three sections, the reptilian brain, the mammalian brain, and the human brain. Well, that is a very nice way and simple way to kind of condense the immensity and grandioseness of our brain, it's incorrect. Basically, we, up to this point, we've always talked about localized brain activity. And that is correct physiologically, but it is not correct psychologically. Psychologically, our brain, all parts of our brain, are involved with who we are, with our personality, with our likes and dislikes, with who we claim as identity. So rather than consisting of these local centers, that element, that essence of who you are is spread throughout your brain. And that's why we've been able to help people such as the community within Alzheimer's and the dementia community remember their spouses or remember how to walk. Because you have these neural pathways that are built, but then the senses, because it's quick access information, it's almost like an expressway to ideas. It's an expressway to an emotion. And that's, again, created for our survival. So during our formative years, that's when we start creating these frameworks. Now, these frameworks are partially societal. These frameworks are based on the environment where we grow up. And it's not necessarily uh, how your parents treated you, but it's more of as you were developing your prefrontal cortex, which we'll talk about in a second, children under the age of seven have no critical thinking. 
literally the neural activity in the prefrontal cortex is absent. They're still building those frameworks. So that's why we call, that's what I think we describe as innocence and that joy that children bring with the things that they say and the things that they bring up. This is what makes us human. This is what brings us critical thinking, what brings us language, comprehension, the ability to recognize who we are, the ability to connect, the ability to see your face, music. All these interesting and beautiful human qualities happen here. Now, it's not all beautiful. This is also where stress happens. This is where, I'm sorry, anxiety happens, not stress. Now, as a species, we have several parts of our brain designed to keep our children safe. These stress elements, which are controlled in our amygdala, in the center of the brain, this is what really we talk about when we talk about flight or fight response. Now, I want to talk about the difference between stress and anxiety and clear, a clear line for you. Stress happens here. These chemicals released into your body, these neurochemicals, make your heart accelerate, make you sweat, make you clamp up, make you want to run, make you want to go. Anxiety, on the other hand, happens here. You're thinking about stress. You're thinking about all the negative things we heard on day one, about the conditions of our world, about the societal issues, about our earth. When we think about these things and just think about them, it also activates the amygdala, except nothing's really happening. So I want you to think of stress as a lion chasing you, right? Wow, I'm stressed. It's going to kill me. Anxiety is me thinking about that lion chasing me. Now, why am I sharing this with you? It's because the brain is all about energy conservation. Again, an extension of nature. We are nature. And the brain wants to reduce any kind of unnecessary activity it doesn't want to do. So it will take shortcuts, and sometimes, many times, it will actually trick us. So that's why we need to pay attention to what is stress versus what is anxiety. You have the power to modulate and control what you believe is anxiety because it's not physically there. Yet, it feels like it's physically there because these neurochemicals are being produced. So what do we do? So our senses really provide the information that we need for our brain to reference the past and say, okay, I'm stressed about that lion chasing me or I'm anxious about that lion chasing me. What did I do the last time that's going to help me survive this time? Now remove the lion, and I want you to place mentally the challenges in your life as a lion. These challenges keep you up at night. These challenges interrupt your digestion. These challenges affect your hormones. Why? Because it's cortisol being produced. And while cortisol is amazing when we are actually in life or danger, it's not amazing when it's constant and actually is destroying our bodies. And today, massive issues that we have, every disease that we know today here on humans has something to do with this. So this is where my interest was. What if we can understand how to use some of the sensory information in a personalized way to help you overcome those difficult moments? So when our brain sees an image or an experience, it pretty much, this is what the brain computes. And it's not just color. Imagine each one of these pixels being different sensory information, one being one sound, one being a shadow, another being maybe a color. All this information that gets computed in the brain. So things, for example, like color, we can't really say if it's physical because from what we understand, it's computed in our brain. So because memory is vital to our species survival as well, we store this information, and this is what we call knowledge. So again, we start with signals, are these random sensory electromagnetic data that then the brain translates into information. And this is where, okay, how does it go and how does it allow me to understand this moment? 
Now, when it becomes knowledge is when you can almost do that subconsciously. Now, this is where most of us stop in our journey. This is where most of us accept, well, this is just who I am. This is just the way I am because we make it to that point. And this is where we have an opportunity to be the best version of ourselves. In some of my darkest moments, and as I was learning about the brain and learning how to use the senses to activate, not just to feel better, but to be the best version I could be of myself. And for the last six years, I've made many promises to myself. And the one promise that I can tell you I've always fulfilled is being that best version of myself. And this is the moment that allowed me to do that. When I understood that knowledge that stays within is meaningless. Our memories make us who we are. They're the experiences. They're those simple moments, whether it's our children, whether it was breakfast this morning. These are the things that we believe is identity, right? These are the, the crucial, beautiful moments that we capture. Inside our mind, these moments take place and take space. And we have storage capacity in our brain. So not all sensory information weighs the same. In fact, that's why we remember less of what we see, because we see so much. So what's interesting is that, yes, you can remember something through a regular pathway, but if I ignite a specific smell, it can ignite the sound, the touch, the temperature, the motion of that experience from before. Emotional intelligence refers to really how we extract that knowledge from our memory, and it basically describes our responsiveness. Now, what is emotional intelligence? Just to break it down a little simpler. Awareness, self-awareness. Now, when we talk about some of the amazing things throughout this incredible series, we've talked about awareness a lot, and that's great. But this is where our community seems to be stuck in. We haven't moved all the way here. This is where behavioral change is. So I want you to look at some of these elements and think and say, where are you in this journey? Are you self-aware of how you behave, of how you think, of how you share, of what you contribute? Are you empathic towards yourself? towards others, towards the unknown? Do you motivate yourself in those moments of doubt? Do you get out of the rut because of that motivation? Now, can you also regulate your emotional responses, how you subconsciously may react to something? When you understand how your brain works, when you understand the frameworks in which your emotions are shared with, you have an opportunity to regulate. You have an opportunity to say, you know what, I'm not going to react that way because right now I'm angry that this person spoke to me in this way and I accept that I'm angry. I accept that this moment made me upset. But I'm also empathic about it's not just this moment. This emotion is built on thousands of other difficult moments that I'm experiencing in a compounded way. From there, I motivate myself and say, you know what? You can get out of this. Yes, this person may have upset you. Yes, I'm now aware that it's not just this moment that is upsetting me, but other moments from before. And now I have a choice to get out of that moment, to stay stuck in that moment. How do you regulate? How do you respond? How do you change? What we've seen is that when we look at micro changes, we really see long-lasting changes. And I think part of what I want to inspire in you today, not I think, I know what I want to inspire in you today, is to start taking conscious steps, micro steps, towards those great goals that you have. I'll share, I'll share an example of how this works. Many people want a six-pack, right? I want a six-pack. Now, what is their challenge? Normally, they say, well, I just don't like the gym. When we look deeper, it's, I can't wake up in the morning to go to the gym. 
So the micro habit changes there is actually, I want to become a person who wakes up early. I want to become a person who wakes up early and eats healthy. Person who wakes up early and eats healthy and goes to the gym. Consistently. Here's your abs. When we break down some of these systemic issues, we have to break it down into micro. And, you know, this is something that you're going to see in therapy, in medication. You're going to see this continue to expand. Because right now, think about it. We have more solutions than ever before. We have more medicines than ever before. We have more self-help books, more documentaries, more events, series, symposiums, name it. Yet, we're dying of diseases of despair. Something's not clicking. Something's not happening. And think about this, and I'm not going to ask you to show a show of hands, but think inside your mind. When's one time that what you did disagreed with what you thought? Every time for me, right? <laughs> this is what we're trying to narrow the gap. How do we narrow the gap between who we are and who we want to become? These are the steps that we can take to solve some of these grand challenges that we're speaking about. So what happens when knowledge extends beyond the confines of our mind? To change our world, we need to change ourselves. We need to look introspectively inside into the universe, into this magnificent, magnificent universe inside you. You know, ultimately, we are these custodians of these 6.4 trillion cells, probably more, of these systems, of these animals we call organs. We are. It is, and I don't exist without you, you don't exist without me. So we need to remove that part of the ego with the eye, and we need to understand that what we put out stays out there. And our predictive brain will create and frame how we feel. So how do we unframe some of these broken frameworks that we have today? By sharing. You know, I'm from the Dominican Republic, as some of you know. I've spent quite a long time in the United States, including many universities that I've attended there. And, you know, the polarity that we see there isn't just there. You see it between Russia and Ukraine. You see that between some other countries as well. Actually, I see that between my neighbors, between my colleagues, between everybody here. We need to evolve from calling out to calling in. And that's the big difference. By us opening up and understanding people's framework of their thinking, we evolve from this right and wrong to how do we shift and expand that perspective? How can I understand that perspective? When I think of some of the challenges that we experience today, I think our biggest issue is communication because we are all feeling the same shit. And my goal, pardon my language, is to make life a little less shittier. I started out wanting to change the world. What I had no idea about was what I was gonna change. And I no longer have that as a goal to change the world, but to create tools through my own self-discovery and share those tools so that you can empower yourself and enable the change that you see. Ultimately, each and every person in this room has an opportunity to become the change you seek. Think about that. Are you, do you live, do you express, do you share, do you communicate, do you act upon what you believe, or is it just a facade? Go deeper. There are more layers that we need to tap into to make the change possible. If you're here, you're already making that first step. But we need to do more. Wisdom is knowledge that empowers others. 
And at my cocoon, which I have our lovely two founders, can you guys stand up for just a quick second? Let's give them a great round of applause. <laughs> Don't fall now. <laughs> Valerie Corsias and Dominique Kelly, they're my partners in, the, in, in this company called My Cocoon. Now, I want to share what our wisdom is. We've collected extensive knowledge on color in the senses to create what we call sensory resets, our evolved way of looking at meditation. How can we create these micro moments to help people shift their perception of that moment and those challenging moments that are uh, keeping us stuck, keeping us in that quicksand? Now, we do this through talks, workshops, and experiences, but ultimately, what it's all about is connecting you with you, keeping you away from the distractions of your mind and reminding you of the essence of who you are. And ultimately, you are a system within systems. Now, we've used these technologies to empower people of all ages. Color is universal. For us, we're looking at how do we explore these micro-interventions that can help people in just a few minutes shift their perception, perhaps from pain, from apathy, from anger, into those complementary emotions that we discussed earlier. Ultimately, if we want to make it to wisdom, we have to share that knowledge. We have to ensure that that information is correct. We have to ensure that that data is gathered ethically. But most importantly, we got to go back to our intention. Begin in a comfortable position with some connection between your body and the earth. Through your feet on the ground or through your seat. Allow your gaze to settle into the colors you see. Feel into a natural, relaxed breath. Our busy, demanding lives can leave us feeling disconnected and depleted like uprooted plants searching for fertile ground. This meditation anchors your energy into its source, the ground of your own being through color. So start by becoming aware of the body part that is in contact with the earth. Then take your attention to the whole body. Sense into the connection between your body and its contact with the earth. Now let yourself imbibe the colors you see. Feel them. Feel them as you stay rooted within your body, into the earth. Allow them to anchor you into a sense of your own inner grounding. Mm -hmm. 
By doing so, you are tapping into your inner reserves. A source for you to draw from whenever you need it. It is abundant and constantly replenishing in energy. Continue to feel this rooted connection to yourself. And slowly expand this connectedness to others in your environment, your life, the world, Know that the power and strength of this connection is always within you. You are able, abundant, and grounded. So I wrote something this morning that I want to share with you because ultimately our goal here is to become agents of change. We have this unique chance to share what we've learned. So I want to read something, which is a commitment that I've made. I will try no matter how small. I will try no matter how small. No matter how small my contribution may be. No matter how small my contribution may be. I will try. I will try. Not as a passive. In the face of need, but as an active participant, as an agent of change. The collective power of our brains works miracles. With you, with me, with each other. Thank you so much.